determining the after repair value. Let me say this. I never recommend as an investor to pay to be in more than the property's worth. I never recommend as an investor to be into a property more than it's worth. I don't see how that could be a deal. Um, I actually recommend working to obtain equity. Uh, because of my strong belief in that, we normally provide our investors on single family between 20, 15 to 25% equity in your deal. I believe that's, that's part of being a real estate investor is obtaining equity within your deal. Um, so whether you're, you're doing this for your own owner occupied or you're doing this for your investment, um, you should always do your due diligence in regards to after repair value. This is one of the areas that people always wonder, how in the world can I obtain the after repair value? How, where, am I, where do I start and what do I do with the information that I gather on this? So uh, Real Worth Network asked me to present on this and I was very excited to do so because this is what I do for a living. So it's really easy. Has anybody uh, got any ideas on, on how to obtain an after repair value of a home? An appraisal is one idea. Yeah. Do the comps. Do the comps, CMA, comparative market analysis. I'm, I'm going to talk about those two um, here. So you're, you can hire an independent appraisal, appraiser to do an appraisal. Um, now, I'm going to read off my thing here a little bit because there's a lot of information. Uh, um, you can contact them. Now, the pros of contacting an independent appraisal, appraiser, or they provide you with a very extensive report. So when you get that appraisal report, it's, it's, it's extremely extensive. It has a lot of good information. Also, they provide a third party opinion. They're, they're not related to the transaction. They provide a third party opinion in relation to the value of the home. The cons of an appraisal are time. Appraisals take time. And when you're researching deals, Especially, you know, I know in California, deals fly off the market. You, people pay like hundreds of thousands of dollars over what the asking price is. Um, you know, in Pittsburgh, the, the market's hot. So most good areas right now are very move quickly. So if you want to obtain an appraisal on every deal that you're going to buy, you're probably going to miss out on a lot of good deals. The other downside is the cost. The normal cost of an appraisal is about $450. So if you obtain an appraisal on every single potential deal, you're, let's say you look at 10 deals a month, um, what's that, $4,500 a month in appraisal fees. Um, so, and, and, and the third con is appraisals are still very subjective. Even after you take that time and you miss out on a bunch of deals and you pay that money, the appraisal is still subjective. It's the appraiser's opinion. I've had appraisals on the same exact property one come in at 50 and another one come in at 85. Now when you say $35,000, that's not a big deal. When you look at the percentage difference, that's huge. That's over, what, 60% difference. Yes, sir? When you're getting qualified for a loan, don't they have to get an appraisal to some degree? If you're purchasing the property with financing, yes. Yes, in, in, in our case, you normally purchase the property cash, renovate cash, and then refinance afterwards. So we're going to talk about the other way to do this. Um, now note, it is not common practice for a real estate investor to use an appraiser to obtain the value of their, their investments prior to purchasing the property unless they are purchasing with financing. So the other route you can go, you say, well, what's my next option, and Craig stated, a CMA, which is called a comparative market analysis. Um, so we're going to talk about comparable properties, obtaining comparables in the area. Um, now, the number one uh, way to do this, and really the only way is, you must build relationships with local realtors. So in any area you're going to buy in, if you want to obtain CMAs ahead of time, you want to build relationships with two separate realtors if possible because realtors have access to the MLX, which has a lot of data, which will allow you to do what we're talking about. Um, CMA is an estimate of the home's value compared with others. When purchasing in an area, uh, you want to build those relationships. Now, you also want to look for, the more sold comparables you can get, the better. 
What you're going to find when you're looking at comparables, when you're looking at properties, you have ones that are sold, ones that are contingent, and ones that are active. The sold comparables means it has sold at some point in time, so it's already sold. Um, the uh, contingent means it's under contract. When you look at the contingent, it doesn't tell you how much it's under contract for. You know how much it's listed for, but you don't know how much it's under contract for. And when you look at active, that's a property that's currently available. It's not under contract, it's not sold, but it's currently available. That gives you an idea of, of what's happening in the market, um, what's going on out there, but that doesn't tell you what's, what's actually sold. So, you know, I, I could list a property in an area that I know is only worth sixty for two hundred thousand dollars if I wanted to, um, which would skew the numbers. So, you, so you want to take that into consideration. Now, the pros of a CMA are the cost. The cost is normally zero dollars. If you build a relationship with a realtor whom you're going to use, whom you give business to, your cost for a CMA is normally zero dollars. Your time, you could normally get a CMA back within twenty-four hours without a problem. And um, they, they can be very effective in determining your ARV. If you analyze the data properly, a CMA can be very effective. I've found some CMAs to be more effective than appraisals. Um, the cons, um, this sounds like a contradiction. I just said it can be effective. The cons are that it could be very ineffective. <laughs> if you have the wrong person giving you the data, if that individual wants to skew the data, or if that individual doesn't know how to do a proper CMA and analyze the data, it can be an infect, it could be ineffective. And the other downside to a CMA is that you need to do a lot of your own research. Not a lot, but you do have to put extra time and energy in once you obtain that CMA. You actually don't have to, but you're going to see later in the presentation, I recommend that you do put extra time and energy in once you obtain that CMA. Okay, when looking at comparables, what we're looking for is make sure they are comparable. You want to make sure that your comparables are comparable. What do I mean by that? That sounds kind of funny, huh? Um, you want to make sure it's the same building layout. If, if you're, the, the building you're purchasing is a ranch, you want to make sure that your CMA, your comparables, are ranches. You don't want to compare a ranch to a two-story home. They don't they don't compare. It's not apples to apples. Um, make sure it has the same number of bedrooms. As you know, anybody in here who has rented or purchased a home, um, the, number, the number of bedrooms makes a big difference. You're going to pay more for a three bedroom on average than a two bedroom. Uh, make sure it has similar number of bathrooms. You know, three bedroom, two and a half bath as compared to three bedroom, one bathroom, you're going to have some different price adjustments there. Uh, make sure it's similar size. A lot of people forget about this. They pull up all the three bedrooms. Now this is kind of hard because MLX doesn't really put the square footage anymore. They, they stopped doing that several years ago. Um, so you need to talk to the realtor about this. But for example, a three bedroom home that's 2,100 square feet as compared to a three bedroom home that's 1,200 square feet. That's a dramatic difference in square footage. That's going to greatly affect the, the, the home sales price. Um, one of the things I just touched base on a little bit ago, make sure it's the same school district. If, even if you're in the same area and you could be in two different school districts, that will greatly affect your value if one school district is better than the other. Adjustments that meet, need to be made to the comparables. So you have your comparables. They are comparable. They're very similar, as similar as can be. Um, you have some sold com comparables, we call them comps. You have some sold comps, you have some contingent comps, some active comps. Now you need to account for the differences. Your, your realtor who runs your CMA will probably do this, but they don't always. It depends on how busy they are, how much they know how to do this. This is something when you're asking for a CMA, do not just get your CMA report and at the end it says, our suggested sales price is this. Take that and say, oh, okay, that's what it's worth. These are things that I am telling you and that Ron and Kathy will tell you that when you get that CMA, these are things that you now should do. These are things that you now should make sure were done or if weren't done, you take into consideration yourself. 
Um, adjustments need to be made on comparables for size differences. Like I just stated, 2100 versus 1200 square feet, that's gonna be a big. Uh, number of bathrooms, that's important. You, on your CMA, you will see three bedroom, if you're buying a three bedroom, one bathroom, you will see three bedroom, two bathrooms, or three bedroom, one and a half. There has to be some sort of adjustment down for your three bedroom, one bathroom. Whether the house has an air conditioner or not, central AC we call it. Um, a house that has central air is probably has a little bit more value than a house that doesn't. Whether the house has a garage or not, compare that to your property. Um, whether the house has a yard, that makes a difference. You know, it, it, I can't tell you there's no bottom line cookie cutter adjustment to make for each of these. You, you need to speak with realtors in the areas to help you determine what those numbers are. But having a yard is very important to some people. Yes, ma'am. In, in a home, is there, um, I mean, how much about is the adjustment, say, between two bedrooms and three bedrooms, three bedrooms and four bedrooms, how much, or a bathroom, two, bed, two baths, or three baths? Is there an amount that you look at? You need to speak to the realtors you've built relationships with in that specific area. That Curry Hollow example, we found that um, going from a two to a three bedroom is probably going to be about a $20,000 to $50,000 difference depending on how big that third bedroom is because the makeup is primarily um, families. But if that area more consisted of not big families but, but smaller families like a husband and wife and one kid, then the jump from a two bedroom to a three bedroom wouldn't be as much. So it's important that all of this due diligence goes together. So you have to understand the picture as a whole and then once again building those strong relationships with people you trust in the area who are educated, that's invaluable also. Um, another another um, adjustment would be the location. So for example, if, if the house that's a comparable is closer to a major, um, major highway that could get you there quicker, there may be an adjustment for that. Uh, closer to a park. Um, there's just different little things to take into consideration. Um, I'm not saying that you should spend you know, 20 hours doing this, but put some of your time and uh, energy into this. Then, your next step in your ARV process is considering the outlier factors. I, lo I love this picture because you see that there's a big, some sort of plant there. That's an outlier factor. Um, outlier factors well, could be the street. Um, is, it a is it on a major road? That's a, big, that's a big outlier factor that just by looking at the MLX and just by looking at the pictures wouldn't tell you. But if the property you're looking to buy is on a major street, what I mean by that is like two lanes each way where cars are going 45 to 55 miles an hour, and the other homes are back on a quiet street, you're going to need to detract your value for that. That's going to be less attractive. I know at least for myself, being, having my, my, my wife and kids back on a quiet street as compared to being right on a main street, pulling the car out of the driveway, those things are major factors, outlier factors that you want to take into consideration. Uh, power lines. Uh, what I mean by that is, it, are the are the post and the power lines right in the backyard? You know, that people people get scared about radiation and and different things like that. So you you want to try to take that into consideration if possible. Uh, railroad tracks. I don't know. Do you guys have railroads here in California? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people get run over every week. <laughs> <laughs> Railroad tracks, you know, if the property you're looking at has railroad tracks in the backyard, um, that's something, you know, when, when, when you're, someone's going to buy your property or your tenants are going to rent your property and they hear that train whistle running by, that may be a detractor, something you want to take into consideration. Also, business activity. Are you right next to a major business park where there's trucks and cars coming in and out all day into the evening? Something to take into consideration. Any outlier? Any other outlier factors anybody can think of? Yes, ma'am. Well, how many bridges do you have in Pittsburgh? We have the most bridges in the world. We have 446 bridges. And is those a benefit or a deterrent? For for us, it's a you know for us Pittsburghers, we don't like to cross a bridge. 
We, you need a passport to cross a bridge in Pittsburgh. <laughs> but uh, um, it, it's very helpful because you don't have a lot of traffic. So you, if you live by a bridge, a bridge doesn't, it's just normal traffic. I mean, if you're right under a bridge, that could be a deterrent because you have a lot of cars going over top of you. Uh, but there's not many homes that are like almost right under the bridge. But that's a good point. Shopping. What's that? Shopping. Shopping. Very important. Shopping can be an outlier factor. How close is the home to have access to shopping? Um, you know, you could be in the same neighborhood and you can have one home that is in walking distance from the, from the main street with shopping and, and, um, and food and, and things of that such, and another home that's further away. That's a good outlier factor. Anybody else? Airport. Sorry? Airport. airport. Your your proximity to the airport. Very good. Parks. Parks. Yeah, especially with families. With rec centers. Yes, very good. Parks and rec centers. Anything else? Hospitals. Hospitals. That's right. What you're talking some of these things though, it depends on the value. Like you're talking about a bridge being very valuable to be near in Pennsylvania. So how do you know who values what where? Right, that's where, once again, your relationship with either an experienced team, an experienced realtor, or a combination of thereof will help you to determine this. These are outlier factors. You, you know, it's not going to, most of the time, some of these outlier factors aren't going to make or break a deal, but sometimes they can in your value. It depends on how much room you have in your valuation. So these are things that I'm stating that we do that um, you may not take into consideration because you don't do this every day. We, we're doing this every single day, so we, we end up taking all of this into consideration. Um, and, but we are the team that knows the area. Uh, but in areas where we don't know so well, like recently in Pittsburgh, we started investing a lot more on the east side of town. What we've done is we've hooked up with realtors on the east side of town who know that area like the back of their hands, and we made sure, this is very important, we made sure the realtors that we hooked up with are real estate investors themselves. A, a non-real estate investor realtor isn't going to accurately be able to give a real estate investor the information they need. So I forgot to, to point that out at the beginning. When making relationships with the teams you're working with, the realtors you're working with, make sure they're real estate investors. That's what I like about, I forget the guy's name who does the homeowner's insurance up here. Um, I don't work with him right now, but I'm going to contact him and maybe start to build a relationship with him. The fact that he's a real estate investor is major. Anybody on your team you're working with as a real estate investor, you want to make sure that they are also real estate investors.